Hello everyone, so today I'm going to talk about the seven things that I did to become a polyglot. Before we start, I just want to give a brief breakdown of my languages. So, I'm a native speaker of French and Portuguese because I am French and Portuguese. I also speak English to a high level. I mean, I hope, I think, you tell me. <laughs> um, I also speak Spanish. My Spanish is around B2 level. Some people say it's C1. Uh, but I don't think it's C1. I think it's around B1, high B1, maybe B2. I also did Italian at school about a decade ago. I can still speak it a little bit, but I forgot because I don't practice it as much. But I can still understand a fair bit um, because of how similar Italian is to Spanish, Portuguese and French a bit. Finally, more recently, I've started learning Japanese and I've got lots of updates on my Japanese on my channel. I will put a link to a playlist uh, that I have in the description box below. And without further ado, let's start the video. So the first thing that I did is to learn basic grammar and vocabulary. So I know a lot of people aren't really keen on grammar and there's a lot of debate about whether we should learn grammar at all or whether we should learn lots and lots of grammar. I kind of would say it should be between the two. Personally, I think grammar is useful at beginner stages and also in the intermediate stage uh, to some extent. The reason why I advise everyone to learn grammar at the early stages is because it will help you with understanding the structure of the language and how to form sentences. And also it will help with meaning. I will give you some examples. So if we take French, it's quite useful to know about gender and number for adjectives, for example, because that helps you understand why sometimes we pronounce words differently depending on the context or why we write them differently as well. Well, another example. So in Japanese, it's quite useful to know the word order because even if your grammar is not 100% accurate, it will still make the meaning you're trying to convey easier to understand. So in that sense, grammar will really help you if you have a good understanding of where words go, essentially. Of course, if you want, you can keep on learning grammar at higher level, but there's something even better that you should be doing instead. And that's what I'm going to discuss in the second point. So number two, I immersed a lot. Immersion can be quite frustrating because you can't see result instantly. So it's not like after a day of watching eight hours of TV shows, for example, you will feel um, you know, strong progress. It's something that's really over time. The main advantages I think of immersing is that you really learn lots of vocab and idiomatic phrases. And also you gradually develop an instinct for the language. So it's not perfect, but the more you watch and listen to content, the more you kind of get a feel for what sounds right and what sounds wrong. And also you will sound more natural when you are speaking or writing because you will be using sentences that are said by native speakers. Number three, I studied languages at school and also at university. Of course, as someone who likes languages, I had to study three languages at school and also study English and linguistics at university. I don't actually think you need to study languages at school or at university, but it's really helpful because you will usually learn more advanced grammar, especially at university, which I did. And that really helped me to have a more refined English and use more advanced structures and essentially access the C1, C2 level because I was also writing a lot in English uh, and doing research in English. So if your goal is to do a bit of academic research or work in sort of very scientific jobs, I think formally learning the language really helps. Number four, I took every opportunity to practice my target languages. So I'm lucky enough that I was born in Paris and Paris is obviously very multicultural. So I had lots and lots of opportunities to practice my target languages with friends or even strangers in the street. This means that whenever I had the chance, I would interact with foreigners. A group of Spanish people looking lost, Hola, necesita ayuda? An English tenant who just moved into my building? Hey, let me introduce myself. <laughs> okay, I'm not very good at doing skits. Okay, of course I do get how that might be difficult for some of you if you don't live in big cities, but if you ever do get the opportunity to speak to foreigners, then do it, go for it. Number five, I replaced my native language with my target languages. What I mean is not that I stopped speaking my native language, that would be a bit extreme maybe, but I tried to replace all the things that I like to do in my native languages in, with my target languages. So for example, if I like watching French TV shows or French films, then I try to watch as many as possible in English. I also try to read more in Spanish. When I'm on YouTube, I try to watch videos in Japanese, etc, etc. So the idea is to replace things that you normally would do in your native language or languages and do them in your target language because normally there would be things that you typically already enjoy doing. So 
that means that you can enjoy doing something while learning a language or practicing a language. That feels like a win-win situation for me, right? Number six, I carefully listen to how natives speak. I don't know if that's a weird thing about me, but when people speak, I really pay attention to the words they choose, the grammar they use, in what context, are they maybe older, are they younger, are they female, male, are they from a particular group? And I just find it so interesting. I don't know if that's because of my short background in sociolinguistics where we like to study how people speak depending on what group they belong to, but I find it so, so interesting. I think this is really useful because it will help you sound really natural because you really pay attention to what people say in which situation, in what context, with whom, etc, etc, etc. And also, I think it gives you a cultural understanding of some of the words uh, that are used in the language. So things like the connotation of the word. So it's not just about formality and informality, but sometimes using a word in casual context with the wrong people, so to speak, will sound unnatural or a bit awkward, while in other situations situations, that word might be absolutely appropriate and fine. So number seven, I moved to another country. So this one is the most extreme, probably. <laughs> and I'm not saying you have to uh, move to another country to learn the target language, but it definitely helps. And that's kind of obvious because if you move to another country where your target language is spoken, then you will have many more opportunities to practice it. And also what's kind of cool and maybe scary at the same time is that you are forced to speak the language if you want to sort of survive, I guess, because you will have to interact with people that might not speak your native language. And that means that it will give you even more opportunities to practice the language. So it's very beneficial, although it is a bit scary and quite outside of your comfort zone, most likely. All right, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and you found it useful. And please let us know in the comment section what's your main takeaway from this video? What's the uh, tip that you found the most useful? And on this note, I will see you next week. Bye.